start the recording. Great, so that means my um, introduction was also completely cut off, which is even better because that means nobody knows that I like talking. Um, I'm very happy to host a session today. Um, this was inspired by a blog post by Matthew Sequel, who was on this session here before um, two times ago, did recently about how different these careers look like. And he's obviously in the corporate world doing ESG and we're all not in the corporate world, but some of us were. Um, and we try to bring people together here as panelists, but again, this is all of us talking um, to each other, hopefully. Hi, Matthew. Oh, you're here. Um, who have different paths into this world of being in ESG and venture capital. Um, and I'm very, very happy that um, Cecile, Paola, Claudia, and Adrian, this was almost alphabetical. Ah, no, I missed I missed one flip here. Um, and then the man has to go last, obviously, right, Adrian? That, that, that was obviously clear. Um, I'm here to introduce us to themselves and their own paths. And again, we chose those four specifically um, because they, they have four different paths. Um, but this is, again, a conversation between all of us. Um, and we'd start with a very, very simple round of introduction that is a little deeper because we want to hear where people come from. Um, and perhaps, Cecile, we'll start with you, given that I think you have the longest stretch to cover, given your multiple um, roles. Sure. So hi, everyone. Uh, uh, really happy to be here and, and share the story. And do feel free to reach out during the session or afterwards and connect in everywhere you feel like. Um, this is an open invitation always. Uh, I am working from home, so I have cats and they will be popping up once in a while into the screen. Um, just be warned. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Cecile Belilius. I'm head of impact and sustainability for Pitango Venture Capital. Uh, a quick word about Pitango. We are based in Israel. Uh, we are one of the oldest and biggest VCs in Israel from the first batch of VCs of the early nineties, meaning that, uh, in 2023, we are 30 years old. Uh, Pitango is a platform of funds. Uh, it has raised over $3 billion and deployed over $3 billion uh, in its 30 years. Uh, we currently have about 90 portfolio companies this spread over uh, three family of funds. One is an early stage fund. The other is a growth capital fund. And the, the third is a health tech fund, which focuses on everything health related. Um, personally speaking, um, I have been in the impact investing space for the past two decades. Uh, been very lucky to join the Nober Foundation in the early 2000s uh, as uh, on their team when impact investing, venture philanthropy, all these things weren't even these terms weren't minted. Um, and we really wanted to do. We wanted to really reconnect capital and values and use technology for that. That was like the main theme. I joined them in trying to understand what that even meant. And <laughs> just uh, was very, very experimental. Spent many years in what we would call today anything from venture philanthropy to impact investing, uh, all of it around tech. Uh, and um, and I represented the foundation in Israel, so I did a lot of uh, of these things in uh, in Israel. Uh, in 2011, I founded Impact First Investments, which was Israel's first venture, uh, impact investing uh, um, company. Even though we're in our time. I thought it would be a fund. Uh, I mean, I kind of guessed that by 2011, uh, people knew already that uh, impact investing existed and that you could blend technology with it and that it would just make sense that you can make money and uh, impact at the same time. Obviously, I was very wrong. Nobody understood what I was talking about. Mostly spent my time hearing people telling, explaining, mansplaining to me that it cannot be done. Um, eventually raised uh, some capital from uh, high net worth individuals who really uh, allowed me to make eight early stage investments in what I call impact native companies. Um, at that time, I asked uh, Pitango to be my partners. Uh, I needed their skill set and their understanding of, of investing, and they gladly joined, but out of their own capital. They didn't want to risk any LP capital because, frankly, they didn't know if this would make any money. Um, and, uh, and they joined me. We made quite successful invest investments in early stage startups. Uh, and at the end of 2019, after proving our point, we thought, what's next? Then... There were two possible paths. One was to 
set up um, an impact investing fund, uh, larger, uh, with some of our LPs that actually wanted to do that. And the other option was to start thinking about how do we bring the world of impact, sustainability, climate, ESG, and all this alphabet soup into what a mainstream uh, generalist VC would do, which was to me much more interesting and uh, also broke the barriers of the genre of uh, impact investing, which was what I was looking for and scale. Um, and I set out to do this work in the beginning of 2020, looked for some role models or examples, or even just to know what title to give this job and couldn't find any. So, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I, I founded and managed startups before I crossed the borders to be an investor. So that was uh, fine by me. Uh, and then we just started by setting up um, a strategy of blending ESG and impact into what we do. And maybe we'll elaborate a little bit more about that. And that's what I've been doing so for the past uh, four years. Fantastic, thank you. Um, yeah, and you were one of the first people um, to point out that difference, I think, when we spoke before Venture ESG had a name and existed, um, which very yeah. much is what the white paper was based on. Um, perhaps yeah. Paola, Claudia, Adrian, um, over to you three. I was going to say, no one wants to follow that. Um, Cecile, you're going to put us all to shame. <laughs> um, but no, look, lovely to, um, I, I'll mimic the same sentiment that Cecile mentioned. It's great to have all of you here today. Uh, I'm Claudia Levan and I um, work at Lightspeed Ventures. Uh, my role is to oversee our fundraising uh, and ESG initiatives uh, for the firm. Um, you know, we are one of the largest uh, global VC firms with just shy of 30 billion uh, AUM. I'm actually based out in our US um, office, but if you can sort of hear my accent, you know, I'm an Australian that actually spent quite a lot of time in, uh, in London, was there for 12 years. And so as a result, you know, ESG and impact was always kind of core to the DNA. Um, maybe before I sort of talk a little bit sort of around uh, light speed, I mean, maybe to give everyone sort of a context because I'm probably the least traditional path into sort of Kind of doing ESG versus it, it sort of wasn't sort of a lifelong ambition. I think if you think about sort of how I um, you know, started my career in private equity, I was on the private equity fund investment side, uh, ultimately moved over to an IR role in, in London, as I mentioned, and now sit in New York. I think my career was always a little bit more buyout focused. And so the buyout world has always been far more sort of evolved in terms of um, thinking about, you know, company ownership because you are a majority holder. Uh, LPs had a non-negotiable that ESG was something in the buyout realm that you needed to do. Um, and they were always just significantly ahead of the curve. I then actually ended up going to a growth equity firm. Um, and so then, you know, in, again, it started sort of becoming quite critical for a lot of these sort of growth, growth buyout firms to start really thinking and incorporating ESG. And so I was part of the evolution of a firm sort of hiring their first head of ESG, really thinking about all the things that, you know, Cecile, you mentioned the difference and the nuance between impact, you know, versus ESG, and sort of, I think, more recently, you know, the, the key component around, you know, becoming carbon neutral and, and really kind of thinking around climate is, is critical. And so I think every sort of firm is now thinking around that. And so there was the piece around, was it marketing or was it actually real tangible, you know, output? And, and having sort of seen sort of both sides of the story, I think that that's something that really kind of made us, you know, think, how do you, you know, do it in a meaningful way without just sort of having what you sort of call, I guess, you know, greenwashing or just, you know, you know putting out a couple of colorful brochures. It was kind of interesting because when I moved to venture, it was like the wild west. And, you know, Lightspeed is, um, you know, one of the biggest kind of firms globally, but interestingly, you know, ESG isn't something that we've ever really formalized. And so whilst I would argue that we've got a great policy, we're really kind of thoughtful around what we're doing. You know, when I sort of came on board and the team you know, that we work with, we've always sort of thought like our job is to really lead from the front. And having seen what everybody else does, I think that there's a lot of really great firms on the smaller side that can incorporate it. But, you know, I won't mention some of our you know peers, Andreessen, Sequoia <laughs> Index. Um, but I don't think a lot of these firms are really thinking kind of thoughtfully around truly incorporating it. And so I think from an opportunity perspective, we it's very rare to see scalable capital do this and sort of starting something from scratch, so to speak, has been a pretty compelling 
part of the um, the offering that this role has really sort of brought on. I wouldn't say that I ever thought that I would be part of ESG and that would be my role. I was like a fundraiser. My job was to work kind of with LPs, but actually kind of seeing there around, you know, working you know, in, you know, we do have a European practice. Um, we have a great team in, in London and Berlin and, and Paris. We've actually invested in two companies. Um, one is Plan A and one is Supercritical. And their roles are very much to kind of look at footprinting for companies. Um, and then also do the the, you know, the offsetting and, and emission removal. And actually, we kind of realized that we've got a great climate practice. Climate tech is becoming incredibly important. Our job is not just to invest in these companies. We should also sort of, um, you know, practice what we preach to a certain extent and actually start incorporating this within Lightspeed. And so that was really kind of a tangent to how we're now thinking about actually getting those companies to, to kind of incorporate the E within our um, business, which isn't really naturally intuitive to a lot of companies. Um, you know, we've, we've, and that subsequently to us, um, you know, is, is then thinking around kind of more of the, the social and the governance, which I think venture has been very good at doing. I think the challenge of all of this candidly is that it is a huge cultural shift and it's not something that, you know, top tier VC firms have really had to do because candidly for us, it's like, but why? Like who's pushing for this? Is it the founders, entrepreneurs, or is it the LPs? Because if it's the LPs, like we don't really, you know, we've had very great support. We've been oversubscribed. Our performance has been good. Interestingly, I'd say that, you know, founders, VC is a young man's game. More of founders are becoming, um, you know, pretty conscious around some of this stuff. And so actually founders are starting to really push us. I wouldn't say it's like the large majority, but, you know, 60 to 70% of what we do is still hardcore tech. And so, you know, when these guys are kind of, you know, seed series A, taking out fires, the last thing they're thinking about is like, hey, do I have a maternity policy or do I, you know, think about, you um, you know, what my climate footprint's going to be. But there are certain things that I think a lot of these founders really are starting to think about. And so particularly as they grow in scale and they become, you know, the series sort of Bs and Cs and Ds, like their role is very much to kind of, you know, start incorporating this early because by the time you become, you know, IP ready, it's almost a little bit too late to culturally start shifting um, a lot of those practices. And so we just wanted to start thinking that whilst we're not perfect, our job is to sort of almost be on the same curve as a lot of our founders and companies. And really start sort of incorporating things a little bit earlier because over time this will become a requirement. And so rather than putting out those fires sort of down the line when we have to and the governments or, you know, rules and regulations tell us that we have to, we want to start really thinking thoughtfully around this across kind of the full spectrum. So I will say our role is more around the, ES, the ESG as opposed to kind of the impact because, you know, impact, we have great, we create jobs. We obviously you know, have a bunch of great technologies and things that are around that, but I won't, pretend that we're sort of going down the sort of impact path, which I think we distinguish, um, yeah, between that and ESG. But I'll pause there because that's a little bit about light speed, kind of the journey. And I know there was a question here as well around some of the challenges of our peers. Yeah, we get to that, um, Claudia, given that you dropped um, peer opinions in there already, I think there's, especially U.S. conversation to be had in a second. But let's give Paula and then Adrian a chance to introduce themselves too. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having me here, Johannes and Danica. Um, so just to introduce myself, my name is Paula Compesatai. I am actually from Spain, so we have a very international crowd also speaking today. Um, when the name of this uh, webinar went out, I saw that there were different paths, investor, consultant, and so on. And I honestly would say I'm the random one. I don't know exactly where I would fall in this spectrum because I don't have a very con conventional path to VC if there's ever one. Um, in my background, I actually studied law, but quite soon I realized I didn't want to become a lawyer. So I put myself out there trying different things out. So I worked for the music industry and that was also largely admin because either you are an artist or you just basically organize the background of what they do. And that's when I started working more in the consulting and research world and um, working for GLG. And there we were looking into every single kind of questions that a large company might have. It can be about new products, um, internationalization and so on. Um, and then in 2016 already, we were seeing so many requests for sustainability and how to integrate it into their business models, which became a, a very interesting path for me. So I decided to do some executive education uh, here on sustainable management 
uh, by the University of Cambridge. And that's when I joined afterwards CDP, which is the Carbon Disclosure Project, very much focused on the E, which I think, um, and this is also to uh, reference some of Matthew's uh, newsletters, is what people uh, have been focusing first on ESG, um, especially large, large companies, before being scouted by VC to uh, join them as the SFDR in Europe kicked in and they needed very much help in how to put all this together from the ground. So there was not only all the formal steps to put together at, at Project A, but also this culture shift that Claudia also referred to, which I guess that we will be talking a bit about in, in the challenges part, not in the most exciting part of the job, but I don't know. Um, we will see. Uh, just to give you a bit more about Project A, we are also an early stage investor. We focus on very early stage, so from pre-seed to series A. And we are, even though we are sector agnostic, we, the, we do mostly tech and also some deep tech recently. And um, we have these interesting position to set our companies and our founders for success. So when they get further investing for growth, we want to show that we have already given them a very solid foundation in what ESG mean, means. And that is what I'm largely focusing on as well. And um, so that's maybe a quick introduction about myself and Adrian, uh, I can pass it over to you. Yes, uh, thanks, Paola. Hi everyone, uh, thanks Johannes and Danica for uh, inviting me. Always a pleasure. Um, I'm Adrian, I work for the High Tech Gründerfonds in Germany. We are a pre-seed seed investor uh, in, I would say, as the name says, high tech uh, industries, but in basic we do three things, uh, industrial tech, life science and software. And I would say our sweet spot is life science and uh, yeah, the, basically the, the, the hard, hardware cases, because software, of course, as everyone knows, is done by some others as well. Um, our kind of mission as High Tech Gründer for is really to support also the kind of the German Mittelstand. So we have also as the largest investor, actually uh, the KFW and some uh, federal uh, money in, in, in our operation. So half the money we invest uh, comes from the German government. That's just uh, for the perspective later, maybe interesting on, on how we approach ESG. Um, myself, I joined uh, one and a half years ago uh, to set up the ESG operations and also uh, as uh, yeah, one or two years ago, everyone was afraid of the upcoming regulations and uh, they found me. Um, before I was five years uh, in the Ashoka universe, so working for a uh, subsidiary of uh, Ashoka in Germany, fully focused on uh, impact investing, so not ESG, but impact. And before that, I did my PhD about um, impact investment. So I would, wouldn't say, I mean, Cecile is still ahead, uh, given the experience and impact and the years spent in that industry. But I started around 2011 with, uh, when we came to looking into deeper into uh, social businesses and uh, also uh, impact investment. And uh, the PhD was about uh, finance, so I, I still try to do the mix all of uh, uh, impact and finance, and that's what I still try to do today. I would say moving from out of the impact bubble into uh, the ESG bubble and VC bubble uh, was and still is a bit challenging, and that's also maybe a question to the others, because I would say sometimes you feel like it's just a, like a box checking exercise. Uh, and of course, you try to do more than that and more than just the reporting. But uh, sometimes I feel, I still feel that like, well, in the end, uh, is that venture or are those founders really creating impact? And me for myself, I just want to support the ones that do. And so that kind of uh, came along with the shift to ESG. But I liked that change and of perspective uh, as, yeah, well, the, the big bucks are at the moment still in uh, conventional uh, finance. And of course, now ESG is kicking in there also due to regulation. But in, an impact investment uh, is, even though we have the hype of clean tech, it's still kind of a yeah small playing ground. And, and therefore, you have to move the big bucks in order to also change the system and move the money into the right direction. 
And some people say, well, uh, if there's another kind of uh, impact fund popping up, we're like, well, not another one, but I, I, I have the opinion that uh, there can't be enough. So uh, please keep them coming. And that's and that actually, I think, takes us in a, in a good direction. Um, why are you doing this? Um, right, you're coming from this at a variety of, from a variety, sorry, from a variety of different angles. What got got you excited about this? What gets you excited about this? And Adrian, you kind of gave this, I really care about impact. And yeah, sure, I'll do the ESG thing. Um, and we're, as, as we always say, we're kind of raising the bar and we're doing less damage. But what I really want to focus on is actually kind of driving more people here, right? And and in a sense, to see that also connects to your ESG, to SDG continuum, right? Um, but I don't want to take words out of your mouth. Um, what is the most exciting thing um, about this um, for you now? Um, all right, so I'll take that one. Um, I think that uh, a few things excite me. First of all, first and foremost, it's really always about the impact, right? About changing people's lives and affecting them in a positive way and uh, in in every possible direction. So that's like a general comment. Um, what I love about my job is that um, I get to, first of all, as a generalist, we see that it's sector agnostic and invest in all stages. I really get to swim in the pool of all the innovation and all these amazing people who are the founders and smart people that are doing really disruptive things. And it's it's like, wow, mind boggling. And, uh, but I also get to pitch them their startups through my eyes, which they don't usually see. And um, it's because of biases, paradigms, uh, education, all kinds of things which lead entrepreneurs to think about, you know, their business and doing as much as they can to succeed in their business, not think about anything else and focus, 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 which is true. But when I look at their solution, uh, I try to to pitch them the problem they're trying to address through my eyes, be it if, if there if there is a potential impact of the company, then what is the the social or environmental problem that they're addressing and how their product can actually address that. Um, and that mostly knocks their socks off um, because they're not really thinking in that way. And to me, the ability to just add value to what they're doing and have them, go through that journey and understand that when they're thinking about stakeholders and when they're thinking about the problem through that lens, then it creates better product market fit. It, it opens up business opportunities. It opens up markets. It makes them understand where their product could be or what it can do that they didn't think it does and all kinds of things like that. And you know they're all smart people. So integrating that into their business and really creating value, business value for them. And this match of the impact and the value is, is what excites me. Um, next to that, all companies should manage themselves in a proper way. I mean, I'm sorry, but you know, in a perfect world, ESG wouldn't even exist. It would just be how you run businesses, right? It's just not a question. Unfortunately, we're not in a perfect world, so we need to kind of tap into the legal and the HR and the operations and finance and all these things, which, again, in a perfect world would, would take care of themselves and, and try to look at how to um, put them into the highest standards. Uh, of diversity, of creating new ideas, of creating stickiness with uh, employees, you know, employer branding and all that stuff, uh, of trying to harm the planet as less as possible, of governing themselves in a in a in a good way. So these things, they're they're important. They're well, probably more boring than impact is, but that they're like a, a necessary step. It's I look at this holistic uh, approach of ESG and SDG. So everybody has to do ESG. Everybody has to manage themselves in a good way. And if you can, and you have something that your product can do for society or for our planet, wonderful. That's that's the ESG to SDG continuum that I that I actually, if I can share my screen, I'll just show it for a second. No, I can't. Danica, can you allow me to share my screen? Um, and so, and so that's, that's what is exciting. Uh, can I, um, now another aspect of this is that, uh, I think that this profession oh, here, um, this profession is becoming, is going to be, uh, so just a second, um, is going to be divided into two kinds, or maybe that's not for now. Maybe I'll talk about it uh, a, a little later, but um, 
just wanted to to share this uh, this continuum that I was talking about. Um, here it is. Uh, so I don't know, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So this is this is like the strategy in a nutshell. We really believe that we need to disqualify any company that does not at least avoid harm. Invest in those that are creating uh, some positive impact. Work on the uh, ESG of all the companies. Some of them will stop there because they have no impact, and we don't want to do any greenwashing or impact washing. But the ones who do that are in sectors that have an impact will move on to add to the ESG layer also the impact and the SDG alignment. So this is this is how we how we see this, um, and I think this eventually is uh, is what gets at least me excited like in working with all these people and changing their lives. I like that way of looking at things. Thank you. Who else is excited? Claudia, Paula, Adrian. And and what about? Maybe I can jump in next and also give a bit more context to the first part of your question. Why uh, to get into this area? And it's very difficult maybe to completely separate it from the challenges that we sometimes see. So I'm going to try to leave that aside. But for me, um, I was very interested not only in sustainability and impact through a financial perspective, but rather what is the responsibility that companies have, especially in this mm -hmm. moment of history, as we see mm -hmm. uh, we are moving from a past, past times of kings and queens and aristocrats in Europe and whatnot to this new paradigm of huge multinational corporations that hold enormous power. They have huge lobbying um, arms and also are very much shaping our societies. So as much as we want to believe in a free market that will get everything right, there is always going to be that appetite from citizens, not only for governments to be fixing things, but if they also believe in the markets, for the markets to also have some type of responsibility. And in that sense, what I think it's very exciting is that even though we might go right now through a tide where ESG, especially in the US, is being very contested, I don't see any time soon that people will stop caring about it and will ask questions for the companies, not only that they are working for, but they also purchase from. So that was uh, one of my main motivations in to see what is behind or beyond only the financial impact the companies have, but also how they are shaping society as a whole. So in, in that context um, and working in early stage companies, you have a very privileged position to speak with founders that you don't really have when you are in the growth stage or or beyond that, because they are very much outside of these decisions and it gets put more towards the reporting side. I even see it with some companies that they are doing series B and I'm requesting for some data from them. It's no longer the founder that is going to be providing me with this data, it's going to be some working student in some department, I, I don't know. But when you are very, very much at the beginning and um, you are able to sit with the founders and have a conversation about their business, as Cecile mentioned, and I think this is what is very, very impactful and very meaningful for me, is to see what role ESG professionals can have in shaping how a, a product can be designed, um, how they, they think about their own culture and um, what impact they want to see and how they want their identity of the company to be in the world in a more last long lasting way. And I think this is something that usually as investors, we don't do so much to talk about the long term. What is the your 20 year story? Um, but this is definitely something that founders care about. And when you tap into that and you care about their their mission in a in a true way, more than just the financial part of it within VC, I think that you're giving them also something that usually um, would not encounter just because of the nature of the business. Maybe if I can, Clara, you want to go first? No, I, don't I don't know, please, please. Um, what excites me is actually, I expected when when you move from impact to, to ESG, you expect way more pushback uh, when talking about impact and ESG metrics and carbon accounting and all that. And actually, I was surprised that our pre-seed seed ventures uh, already kind of talking with them in due diligence, there was rarely any 
any kind of hard pushback. Actually, from all the almost 80 due diligence I did so far, just one really hard pushback. And we had to uh, put that case down due to the team anyway. So uh, it was OK. Um, so in that part, I was surprised. And uh, next to that, and, and also building on, on what Paula said, um, this early on uh, context uh, where you can still shape ventures. So of course, it's it, it might so sound boring in the beginning, uh, giving yourself all kind of policies. But I I don't know who it said, but like till fifteen people, you can still shape uh, kind of uh, the values within a company. Later, you need consultants, and they are expensive, and in the end, they won't change anything. Uh, but till then, you still have possibilities to shape. Uh, the ventures and that's exciting too. You have to, all this kind of uh, ESG topics uh, and you can uh, guide your ventures in that or the other direction. And that uh, actually is fun. Uh, and look, I'm happy to, to chime in as well. I mean, it's sort of touching on a few different areas, but I think particularly from kind of the seat that, that I am, I mean, the, the ability to really have some sort of influence and sort of advocacy I think for a lot of these companies is ultimately the, the really exciting part and I mean we signed up to, to do a um, our first sort of ESG tracking portfolio company sort of metrics this year and it's funny because we've had so many conversations with with different portfolio companies and we've done it sort of across the spectrum here at Lightspeed and, and naturally there's going to be loads that push back and say what what is this but actually on the flip side, we have had a number of calls that are like, look, we don't know how to actually answer a lot of these questions, but we're really glad that you guys are thinking about this. And by the way, this is making us think a little bit more thoughtfully around kind of our company. And, and it's not even, I would say that the E is probably the area that we don't get as much, but I think the excitement is, you know, even when they think around inventure, it's like the number one thing is around governance. And the one question that we always really have is how do we think about our board composition? How do we think about creating kind of the, the right, you know, whether it's equity splits going forward, how do we think about really moving forward, um, you know, from that perspective? And so I think that, you know, being able to really have them entrust us and, and really kind of work closely with stakeholders that are sort of thinking about their reputation, thinking about how they reduce risk of, you know, um, whether it's misconduct, whether it's, you know, departures, all of that, I think, has just, we, we actually can see tangible um, outcomes, to be honest. And I think that that's sort of where, we haven't got the data to prove it, and that's sort of the point of us starting to really track it. But I have no doubt that when you do have a pretty strong, you know, perspective around the the governance and the social, this ultimately will foster sort of you know better returns going forward. And I think that as those companies really do grow and scale, they become a lot more attractive for you know end acquisitions, for IPOs, for for just generational sort of success. And so I think for us, just really fostering a little bit more of that decision making and really helping them shape and think about that perspective. Um, yeah, that advocacy, I think, is what really excites sort of me around this and um, getting kind of our investment team on board and to, to really kind of, you know, they tend to be very data driven. And so kind of getting a little bit more data that will help us support this, I think will actually just almost be a bit of a self-fulfilling, um, you know, prophecy within sort of what we're trying to build here at Lightspeed. Great. We get to the challenges, I promise you. But I wanted to pick up one or two questions from um, the side panel here. The... The course question, I think we won't take into the conversation. People can answer in, in writing there. But here, Alexandra's question, um, apart from Claudia, you didn't exactly have experience in PE and venture before, right? In a sense, Cecilia said, oh, you thought this was going to be a fun. But um, I think especially right now, as venture specifically is so desperate for the right expertise when it comes to the sustainability and ESG bit, and we we think about this in the same way, right? It's likely a good moment to go into this ecosystem with with that expertise rather than the other way around. I think it's if you have the sustainability ESG knowledge, it's reasonably easy to adapt that. It might take a moment, even if you have done this in buyout. We've actually seen some examples of people who have done this in buyout and who had a tremendous amount of trouble in the venture ecosystem because it doesn't exactly run the same way. Um, but what would you say? Um, it's reasonably easy to get into a, a sustainability role without the PEVC experience, right? So I think this the the role around ESG, sustainability, etc., is going to be evolving into two kinds of of jobs. 
One is going to be people who create a strategy, who um, make a fit between all the regulations and best practices, et cetera, and their own uh, investment thesis, geography, domain, et cetera, uh, and implement it and help founders think about their company culture and what they want to build and whether they want to have an impact or can they have an impact? And if they don't, how do they actually maybe tie some uh, advantages to uh, of, of ESG to climate, for example, through their products, things like that. And those are going to be people, well, I'm more of that kind of people. Um, and, and these are going to be, I think, people who have been consultants, have thought about um, how to move companies or funds or even large corporates through that path and, and you know, the challenges and the pushback and all these things. The second part of this uh, profession is going to be more people that are more like um, like in the accounting departments. Uh, so a lot of regulation, reporting, uh, collection of data, understanding the data, uh, increasing the amount of data and the quantity or and quality of the data that is uh, collected from companies, from wherever, uh, the adaptation of the uh, models uh, of these companies into what is needed by regulations, what is needed by from their clients, which is a big driver for the companies to actually adopt ESG because their clients are asking them to do so. Um, and and those people are going to be more in the CFO uh, department and they're going to be creating all these non, non-financial disclosures that are in the reports. And I think these are eventually going to split into two kinds of people and two kinds of professions. Uh, that's how, how I see it happening. And we've seen that um, we invited Matthew from Schoenbeck, who um, many of you know to this panel as well. And he's been doing this kind of work for about 10 years and, and looking at just even his career in this particular space um, and the wordings around it, um, he's now mostly doing value creation, right? So this isn't even coming under the aspect of ESG anymore. It's like, how do we build better companies? And ESG happens to be a language a toolkit, a way of thinking that helps with that, right? And that, so I agree with you um, completely, Sophia. Um, anyone else wants to come in on this VCP background? I think Adrian, you had your hand up. Also. No? Yeah, well, just uh, I mean, one and a half years ago when I started with ESG, uh, many of the large, not not name, saying names, but of, of the big consultants and law firms out there, they had no clue about the regulatory requirements of all the uh, funds. Just looking at, of course, the the, the European regulation, but uh, so it's. Everyone is still learning, and, and I, I suppose, and, and you still see people out there that are just jumping into the industry as, as not having a finance background, for example. And I would say it's still there, this kind of window for opportunity, maybe like one more year, or half a year, one more year to, to, to start in there. Because, I mean, as you look out there, there's still so many people recruiting. I would say in Europe, you might want to make the differentiation between going into SFDR uh, regulation or CSRD because uh, that uh, at one point it just becomes a uh, different path. You go whether you st stay in, in the in investing industry or you move into a corporate and then it's more CSRD. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's just it. Perhaps uh, before we move on to the challenges, Corey's question here, what's the awareness appetite for ESG and epic driven value creation? So in a sense that loops into the same conversation in terms of where are we, perhaps perhaps um, to reformulate this, where are we when it comes to where does ESG play a role, right? And I often um, see this when I meet people for the first time, um, we just need to do the reporting. We got these LP questionnaires and we need to do the reporting how can we do that better? And I'm like, hmm, good that you're here, but that's not what we're going to talk about now and because you will just have to do that. And so will your startups. Um, but I think this is kind of often the first step and the value creation bit is harder and complicated and, and not the first step and not what people intuitively think about. How do you see this in your roles um, already now? Maybe what I think is that, um, especially in Europe, when the SFDR came through, all of a sudden, all the financial institutions thought we need someone to do ESG and 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 to to support us here, but they didn't really know what they wanted. And 
the ESG professionals, we had to shape a bit the role. And um, sometimes you stay, as you said, surface level and only reporting, but this is not where you're going to get founders excited or where you're going to get um, the best answers um, out of them. And, and really, as, as Cecilia mentioned before, make them excited about how this could look like for their business model. And the reporting, I can tell you, is the first thing that they will outsource. So if this is um, the how you want to, to add value, there's no point. You need to look beyond the data, either through creating benchmark amongst their peers to create this uh, sense of urgency from their side, or you can tell them, I want to prepare you for the CSRD regulation. So here it comes handy as well, if you know a tiny bit of the CSRD regulation, even though it's very, very difficult. Or you can talk to them about uh, material issues that they might not have thought about through a workshop or an onboarding. Here is really where value lies. And as Cecile and also Matthew from Chinevec said before, you start talking about ESG, you start talking about their business as a whole, about their their culture, about um, their, their 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 whole governance and and what other opportunities they see out there. And I think that when you talk only about reporting and this CFO culture, you really start your very surface level. I think and I hope that the next layer of ESG professionals are going to be people that know a lot about businesses. Mm -hmm. So on top of that, they also give you a sustainability lens, very future proof for your business in the future. Yeah. Yeah. In general, if I can comment, I think we have to look at ESG as an opportunity. I mean, it's also a risk assessment tool, which is fine. And it, we use that too, but it's it has to be tied to the business and create value and bring real business value. Otherwise, it's just really boils down to something very superficial, which is ticking the box exercise. And, and maybe just to add there, some financial institutions will stop there and that's okay. That's what it's going to happen. The SFDR will also get to a point in which some people will only be reporting and then someone's will be doing more. But I think I'm looking forward for that moment to happen. So uh, there's a very clear split and a very good understanding of what the company wants out of you versus when things are just settling in and everyone is figuring it out. Challenges. Why is your job terrible sometimes and right we do these breakfasts in london and cecile it's annoying that you haven't been to any of them and we haven't done one in germany either um but hannah um half jokingly calls them esg therapy groups it isn't the easiest job in the world right um and and some of this we've already discussed there's some pushback and internally it's not always everyone is fully on board and wants to do everything what are the challenges to put it neutrally what are the challenges that um, you're seeing in this job um, and per perhaps also what are you doing about them yeah well most of the if i may start most of the time you're the only person within the organization dealing with esg uh, therefore this there's no sparing or the sparing is maybe with your superior uh, or your colleagues but uh, they are not in the esg ecosystem and therefore you lack some like i would say also quality control for that and of course some um possibilities to uh, brainstorm on ideas that's i think a big uh, you, you should be aware of that when you before joining a vc where you're the only one um yeah yeah i would like doing a phd sorry claudia no 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 i was gonna say i mean just chiming in i think the biggest challenge to be honest is that there's the transparency of information and the ability to kind of get you know, the data and availability and sort of trying to compare apples to apples is the most challenging. And so because in venture, it's so new and it's never been sort of a requirement, I think for us, just trying to be able to corral all of that, particularly from a sort of a US-centric perspective, um, is the biggest challenge. And I think that with that, there's a lot of sort of either ability to manipulate data or there's a lot of ability for people to sort of misinterpret what they see. <laughs> and I think that as a result, it just doesn't, you know, the ability to kind of measure, evaluate and sort of see true sort of impact and, and applicability to it is the biggest challenge because 
And internally, that sort of goes back to kind of why we're really struggling, you know, I think within venture to really implement it in a really kind of effective, you know, unit, in a way where everybody agrees on, on one sort of rule set. And so even when we talk about SFDR, I mean, it's, yeah, the SFDR hasn't really been fully applied, I would argue, to VC. And so it's like, even when you look at all the different requirements and you look at, you know, as a US firm, what they need to report, I mean, you suddenly jump from a six to an eight. You know, there's so many challenges for us to really be able to, you know, truly with, um, you know, you know ta- like actually be able to legitimately say, hey, we can provide this information or we are actually doing, you know, what the, the stipulation is. And so that is the biggest, I would you know, honestly argue, for why this hasn't been as implemented as we would like it to be. Beyond all the kind of convincing and everything else that you mentioned, I think that it all sort of boils down, frankly, to that. But if someone sort of told us what we need to do <laughs> and what is sort of the, uh, you know, the golden rule book and this is sort of the, uh, the five things that you need to adhere to, I think that that sort of uh, commonality of um, perspective would make this a lot easier. Yeah, I, 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 sorry, go ahead. Uh, Claudia, if I may ask, like uh, you, but you're still also in ESG, but also in in the fundraising. So how does this kind of c- convert? Because I mean, when you're just not raising a fund at the moment, you just focus on ESG, and when you're within the fundraising, you, you say like uh, ESG becomes more relevant. No, no, definitely not at all. I mean, this I mean, ESG is relevant for us. You know, you know, in theory, we're always fundraising. So we, we're never not in market. And so I would say ESG is very relevant. I mean, it obviously did start you know, because we are getting a push from um, from investors. And so I think investors are really pushing us to, to do better and be better. And so that was kind of the impetus for us to really think about it. But then off the back of that, obviously, founders are also thinking about it. I think if we implement it, it's, you know, we even had this conversation internally. You know, in theory, every LP would like us to go carbon neutral this year but like if we go carbon neutral one year you can't not go carbon neutral another year and so if we do this you need to sort of stick to something and I think if you write a um, a policy and a memo and a target and you're sort of trying to you know lend yourself to kind of doing something you need to stick with it and so for us it's just kind of picking away I would say bit by bit every year so just doing better you know I, I'd like to say that you know eventually we will get to that gold standard but I think for us, we don't know what the gold standard is. And so that is sort of the, you know, the, the problem. I don't know if that answers kind of what you're thinking, but. Yeah, I, I totally agree with everything that's been said here. Uh, to add to that in Israel, the regulation doesn't apply. So a lot of the founders don't even know why we have to do this and they're not under any kind of obligation or regulation. And many of them are developing their products to the US market, which is not uh, has not really started very much applying uh, ESG. So there's a lot of um, uh, kind of trying to push people to do things for the right reasons and for the good uh, incentives on the business side, but but it is hard. So I, I connect with all of that. Next to that, as you might have guessed already, I kind of really hate writing reports and filling in forms and uh, doing that sort of work. Uh, and at Venture ESG, we actually have a support group for funds that are PRI and we can cry on each other's shoulders every time we have to fill in the PRI <laughs> questionnaire and survey, which is uh, not only PRI, any any kind of uh, survey or you know, questionnaire that comes along. Um, but it, frankly, you know, we have more than 15 partners. Each one of them has to uh, be on top of what I'm doing as well and try to report back to me after their board meetings uh, when what have been the progress in ESG, which they don't always remember to do. It's like sometimes it seems like a stupid logistic product problem, but it's it makes our, our life a little bit harder. The, the fact that it's not really streamlined well into the into the system. Um, I mean, if if we had. 80% of our LPs saying, look, we want you to adhere to these ESG standards, then that would, you know, uh, provide a lot of ammunition to all the ESG people uh, in, in VCs saying, hey, look, our LPs are really asking us or demanding this from us. So we, we have to do this. And these are the bare minimum. Maybe there's no gold standard clear to everyone yet, but these are the things that we need to do and let's do them. Um, the fact of the matter is that uh, exactly like Claudia said, we have a nice number of LPs who care about ESG. Not all of them are 
uh, like wouldn't invest if we didn't do ESG or they have other criteria which are important to them. We've had good returns. So, you know, we're always in the market and always fundraising and always we have LPs. With this. this is all good. So it's kind of not a necessity, if you will. And uh, if, if that changed, I think it would make our jobs also a little bit more integrated into, into the funds. But that's maybe like, uh, if I may jump in, like if you look for a job in, uh, in VC within ESG, uh, look for a fund where you have, as Cecil and Claudia said, where you have an LP who is uh, on the topic and probably, or hopefully it's one of the main LPs. And uh, I would add, have a look for superiors that are willing to um, also, uh, yeah, I don't know the English term, but uh, like stand in front of you and protect you from what uh, comes on ESG uh, managers all the time. Uh, my my colleague Claudia, she knows what I'm talking about. So when when it comes, for example, for DI uh, and and everything that goes along with that topic and implementing that in a, a VC setting, a setting which sometimes can be a bit like kind of male, white, old male dominated ecosystem. Uh, it helps when you have one of those old white males on your side protecting you from everything that, that comes along. Maybe then I can chip in last to this, uh, to this conversation on challenges. For me, it would be um, how you still need to demonstrate a very clear return of investment on, on ESG and the, the endless conversation about whether ESG leads to higher returns or not and i would say that it's very very difficult to tell um not only because pitchbook already uh, said so but because right now there's no distinction between those firms that they are doing only reporting and saying that they're doing esg and those that they are doing the value add creation so in that context it's going to be very very difficult to to link um, esg and and higher returns for a while and I would say that, unfortunately, in the back of the minds of, of loads of the um, investors I speak with, there's still this notion that there is a trade-off between looking after the environment and people and actually making higher returns, which is a very, very um, sad way to think uh, about if we, if we take into account that these are uh, people and professionals making investment decisions. So I would say um, the next five years are going and 10 years are going to be crucial as the industry gains more maturity in having professionals like us inside to see us also as a very important part of the equation, not someone that does something additional. Because what I realize sometimes is that when I speak about a, a, an organization and what criteria of ESG they should take into consideration, they're like, oh, I know that. So, for example, data privacy or cybersecurity for a software as a service company is going to be a no-brainer for an investor that is going to be something really critical for the company. Um, however, they don't see it as ESG. They see this is all the core things and then everything else that is kind of a nice to have that is ESG. And I think that that has to change fundamentally to, to be able to uh, do this job in a way more merry, in a merrier way. Great. I don't think I want to ask another question. We actually, despite talking about challenges, landed on um, a positive outlook. Um, leaving the floor to all four of you to say anything else you might want to say, and then ending our very insightful con conversation. When is Venture ESG launching their bachelor program for? Well, I mean, guess where I'm sitting right now. We had a conversation with NYU about this, um, or with somebody at NYU as an executive um, program, and we're speaking to somebody at LSE as well. It's just not the, a good use of our time at the moment, we believe, um, because what you're getting is people new who want to break into venture um, doing that program, which is fine. Um, and, and I think a midterm problem, our short-term problem is, these are people that we need now um, many of whom are already in venture. And actually, I think a, a lot of the impact that we need to have is on decision makers right now, right? Because often that's, they're not, I don't want to say they're the problem in terms of they're not necessarily the barrier, but they don't have the right awareness and expertise. That's where we host so many dinners. 
perfect um, uh, last words. Um, there is a dinner tonight here in New York and actually one tomorrow. Um, looking forward to seeing some of you over the course of the coming hours, um, Claudia. And thank you very, very much, Cecilia, Paola, Adrian, and Claudia for joining today. And thanks everyone who's in this room um, for looping us all, or for, for coming to, to listen. Um, everyone who has questions um, and looking forward to the next in touch session. Again, for anyone who is new to this, we're doing these about twice, three, four times a year for conversations like the one with Matthew, we did um, two in touch sessions ago that are a bit bigger and a bit more um, abstract. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Thanks everyone for talking and looking forward to the next one. See you all soon. Thank you everyone. Thank, Thank you. Bye. -bye.